Okay. There. Okay. I don't like that. Really? I really like that. So we are about to start class number three on Baba Messiah. Um, and um, we have material here, so anybody who doesn't have material, please go ahead. Uh, give some to, uh, to the gentleman in the back as well. See if you can give it to them. Um, and uh, I want to start by reminding you what the case was in our Mishnah. And then I want to read for you another Mishnah. And, and I'm going to explain to you what we're, what we're going to be doing tonight. But first I want to just refresh your memory. We studied a Mishnah, Shenai Mochazim Betalet. There's Reuben, there's Shimon. They come before the judges and they're holding a garment, a Talet, a nice garment, and each one claims to have found it first, right? There's no evidence. We don't know. There's no witnesses. So we have to take them at their word. Each one says, I found it first. No, I found it first. They might be honest and really think they found they, it first. They might be honest. Maybe they actually found it at the same time. Many possibilities. Maybe somebody's lying. So the Mishnah says that we resolve that particular case by forcing them to make an oath. You say you found it first? Yeah, you sure? Okay, make a, make a Shavua. So each one makes a Shavua on the Sefer Torah, and uh, if they're willing to make, if they both make a Shavua, we split the uh, garment 50-50. Uh, Reuben takes 50%, Shimon takes 50%, they go home, end the story. Problem solved. Literally, that was, literally they cut it in half. I mean, well, no, so what they'll do is then, right, I mean, because if it's gonna get ruined, so like, let's say if it's a donkey, right? So if it's a donkey, they'll, <laughs> no, so they'll sell it and they will uh, split the proceeds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, that's okay. There was a similar case in the Mishan, just reminding you of this case because we're actually gonna go back to it. Two people are in a store. Imagine the shuk in Jerusalem, the shuk in Tel Aviv, people screaming, fighting, pushing, shoving. It's, uh, as they say in Hebrew, today it was Yamas Motel, I'll allow myself to use the Hebrew word balagan. It's one big mess, right? Balagan. Okay, so it's one big mess. Anyway, two people see the last item, whatever that item is, and they both want it, right? So each one, they run into the store, uh, both of them throw money at the uh, store clerk and they, they take the item and they're both grabbing the item. Now, who, who paid first? We don't, we don't know the guys. Hey, the store clerk, you know, he's like disoriented from all this screaming. He doesn't know. And now they come to court. Each one says, Reuven says, I paid for, for this first. Let's say it was a chest, a beautiful chest, right? Uh, Reuven says, I paid for the chest first. Um, Shimon says, no, no, I paid for it first. They come before the court. What do we do? Same thing. You pay for it first? Yeah, you sure? Okay, no problem. Make a Shavua. Go ahead. And you want to make a Shavua also? Okay, you both make a Shavua. One of you apparently is lying or one of you is confused and but you both want to make a Shavua, no problem. And we split it 50-50, right? So that's, that's what we study. Um, I want, you have the material, everybody has the material. Look at the top of the page. And we, I'm going to read for you. This, this is a case that our Sugya is now going to deal with, which is why I'm reading it, okay? Um, two people, again, we'll use the same names, Reuven and Shimon. They both uh, go, and you know in English you have the word bailment, so bailment basically means um, uh, you say, listen, um, I'm going away, can you guard my car for me? Can you, you know, take care of my car, put it in your driveway, it's an expensive car, I don't want anything to happen to it. So I say, sure, no problem, you know, you know just give me the keys, uh, the car will be in the driveway. That's called uh, bailment. Am I saying, am I saying the right? Bailment? Yeah, lawyers, I have to be careful. Um, uh, and so I'm the bailee, uh, the person who gives me the car is the bailor. So let's say a similar case. Now the, the case in the Mishnah, they come with a sack of, let's say, golden coins. They're coming in together. Um, there's 300 coins inside the sack, let's say. But Uven, let's say, owns 100, and Shimon owns 200. They come before uh, Levi, and they say, Levi, can you do us a favor? We'd like you to guard these coins for us. We want you to be uh, the Bailey, and when we come back, we're going to take the coins back. Right? It's a simple case. He's going to guard the coin. Now, back then, there was no bank accounts, right? So people would hide the money under the ground. Um, hence all those cartoons where people are looking at you know, treasure maps, you, know, you see all these movies, that, that, that's actually quite accurate because back then there was no place to put money. So people would always be digging and, and hiding the money in various locations and then they would have maps where I had the money. 
Okay, so anyway, they go to Levi, Reuben and Shimon go to Levi, 300 golden coins, 200 coins belong to either Reuben and or Shimon, and, and the other one owns 100. So Shenaim Shi Pizwe Selahat Zemane, one of them owns 100, Vizematam, and one of them owns 200 uh, coins, right? Zeome, and now they come back, they come back a week later, they come back together, and Reuben says, Give me back my 200 uh, golden coins. Zeome Shelimatam. And Shimon tells him, no, give me back my 200 coins. Now the guy only has 300 coins, Hazit, right? And each one is saying the 200 coins was mine. Now the guy doesn't remember. He's like, I, I don't know. He came here with a bag of set of 300 coins. I don't remember who said it was 200, who owns the 100. They're both saying, Shalima time. They're both saying, no, no, it's mine. Noten la zemane, so there's a machloket. There's a machloket in the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, Noten la zemane ve la zemane. First of all, we give 100 to Reuven and 100 to Shimon. The logic is very compelling. We know that they own 100. Nobody's disagreeing that Reuven owns 100. Nobody's disagreeing that Shimon owns 100. That's the minimum. Right? The rest is, um, let's call it a trust account. Maybe the Bedin uh, will take the money, hold it in a trust account for so long as necessary or until Eliyahu Hanabi comes and uh, resolves the issue. So we have this uh, dream that one day the Mashiach will come and, he, and one of the things that will happen is Eliyahu Hanabi will come and he will guide us as to all the questions such as do we say Hallel and Yimatso Beracha or do we say without Beracha? All these questions that are do we electricity, uh, Yom Tov, yes, no, the, it used to be that they used to allow, now they don't allow, I'm not making a Pesach I'm just saying, I'm describing all these questions that people argue about, they will be um, discussed and Eliyahu Hanabi will make the Pesach and will follow it. So they're saying the court will hold on to the extra hundred coins until Eliyahu Hanabi comes. That's the majority opinion in the uh, Mishnah. Yes, sir? So you're saying the rabbis keep the money? The, well, no, 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 the haram. They, the haram for them to use it. They, they can't touch it. it. They hold it. They hold it. Oh, they hold it. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. But, and, it's, and by the way, it's the betin. It was entrusted. <laughs> it was entrusted. It was, and, and, and by the way, the dayanim, just so you know, the dayanim, they were like the most trusted. I mean, they were, they, they were so much bedim. There's actually a dream that this haram, he passed away and entrusted with this haram. It's in the Gemara, was the money of the uh, Yetumim. That's, they would give the money for the orphans with the Hakam because they knew there was nobody more trustworthy. Now, when he passed away, they came to the son and they said, give us the money. He says, I don't know where it is. So they started accusing the son, this is a Gemara, Masech at the beginning. So they started accusing the son of having stolen the money, Has Shalom, and he was crying. And finally, the father came to him in the dream and he said, this doesn't usually happen. You know, usually when you, you know, a person dies, he's in Olam and that's it. But this was such a serious accusation that the father came to the son in the dream and he told him where the money was hidden. He told him exactly where it was and it was hidden in a way where the Gemara says he put one layer under the money and one layer on top of the money. He, 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 he hid the money in a very special way. The Gemara says we understand why he made this special layer on top of the money just in case somebody digs and digs and digs, they'll never be able to find the money because he, he put this special slab that was very solid and they would never find it. But they said, why did he put the slab under the money? Like, that's it. Like, they're not finding it, they're not finding it. Why put it under? I mean, they already found it, supposedly, if you got to the under so part, right? So, no. Um, <laughs> so the Gemara says, in case there is some sort of um, earthquake and the earth sinks, this would be like a platform to hold the money in place, right? So you, the, the Hachamim were, when it came to money, um, there was no, it wasn't a game, they took it very seriously. Um, and, then he, and then he returned the money to the Ektomim and, and it was fine. So, so that's the majority opinion. Majority opinion, 100 goes to the Oven, 100 goes to Shimon, 100 stays with the court. End of story. Amad Biyoset. The Biyoset disagrees, he expresses a minority opinion and it is as follows. In Ken might see that I'm mine. The Biyoset says, look, we know there's a liar here. We can't just ignore the fact that there's a liar. Everything should be the 300 golden coins. Don't give 100 to Tudel then. Don't give 100 to Shimon. Take the whole money, 300 coins, put it with the court, and when they resolve it, they resolve it. You understand? Now, it's, it's puzzling. It's a puzzling opinion, right? Well, why would he say that? I mean, I understand there's a mind and, and there's, a, there's a lawyer, but why would we say take the whole money? You understand the question? Yes, you want to ask something. The punishment no. Right, right. You see, but it's a puzzling, maybe, it's a puzzling thing. Coins, it make a so, no, so we want, there, oh, there's, there's no Shabbat. There's no Shabbat here, right? In this case, there's no Shabbat. So, why would we do that? So, that's one of the goals of the Sugiyah. We'll, we'll actually address that question 
obliquely, and you'll see it at the end, but just for now. This is an introduction to the sugya. Now, um, our sugya is going to compare this Mishnah that we just read, uh, the 300 uh, coins, that's called the Baal Mint, um, to the Mishnah, to our Mishnah, the Mishnah with the garment, where the two people holding the garment, right? It's going to do what's called juxtaposition. I want to just tell you a little about juxt juxtaposition, because if you don't understand that concept, it's very, like you're saying, like, what's going on here, like the Hachamim. So I want to share that the Hachamim were unbelievably modern, and they even had an artistic flair to the way they did things, right? So you need to understand the concept of juxtaposition. So juxtaposition refers to the placement in art, for example, that happens in art, of two or more contrasting and disparate elements in close proximity to each other, right? Um, and, and this can be done either to highlight certain similarities, I'm gonna show an example in a moment, or to create an opposition, and through the opposition, you're like thinking, what, this is contradictory, like this doesn't make any sense, and then, you know, you, you, you derive a certain um, meaning. Um, so let me show you a picture of an art form where this is done. Um, so I'm going to show you the picture, and you're going to see here, um, for those of you who can see, there's a pipe, right? This is a pipe. You see it? Very simple. Mm -hmm. Do you see the pipe? All right. So that's a pipe. It's just a pipe. You see under the pipe, there's some French words. Anybody here read French? Yes, she says this is not a pipe. Yes, she does. Yeah, how do you read this? Ceci n'est pas un pipe, right? Is that right? Right, right, which is a This is not a pipe, exactly. So this is, this for those of you who want to check this up, this is called The Treachery of Images by, the name of the artist was René Magritte. Okay, so what is he doing here? It's a pipe. And what does he write under it? This is not a pipe. So it is, it's a pipe or it's not. A, so this, this happens in art, juxtaposition, where you juxtapose two, two opposing things. Uh, I'll give you another example, uh, Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth. He says um, in the play, um, fair is foul and foul is fair, right? So that's like a, a famous, so what's he doing? So he's creating a sense of ambiguity, a sense of contrast, because he wants to generate meaning by this ambiguity. I want to show you an actual painting and this is a painting by, um, well, I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, God bless. Okay, I want to show you a painting by Edward Hooper. So here you're going to see another painting, right? So there's a ju juxtaposition here between the cafe, which is like nice and lit, and there's human beings, and then there's the street, which is empty and barren and dark. So that's meant to create a certain, um, the juxtaposition is meant to generate certain meanings. So why am I saying this? Because people, they study the Gemara and they're like, you know, the Gemara seems to be all over the place. It's, come, you know, it's, it's asking these questions, it's giving these answers. Okay, you have to understand, the Hakamim and the Gemara were brilliant minds, right? So, for example, what our Suya is going to be doing, it's going to be employing the methodology of juxtaposition, in this case, to Mishnayot, for the purpose of creating an opposition, creating a similarity, generating meaning, and you'll see what the meaning generated is by this juxtaposition. So that's the sugya. That's the theme of the sugya is juxtaposition of these two mishnayot. Let me give you the structure and then we will start reading. The structure of the sugya is very simple. We will read the whole sugya tonight. It's divided into two parts. Is there a Hebrew word for the juxtaposition that you mentioned? Yes, it's called hekesh. Okay, great. Whenever you see in the derashot hekesh, hekesh is actually juxtaposition of two different pesukim. Great. So it's like right there, you see it, hekesh. Good question, by the way. I like that question. Has to do with the word kesha? Connection? Hekesha? No. Okay. No, no, it's a different word. Fine. Okay. So, let me tell you the sugya. Now, you, I mean, you can have a summary in about 10 seconds of the entire sugya. The sugya is divided, in, divided into two parts, part A, part B. Part A, juxtaposition of our Mishnah, the one with the two people grabbing the garment, to the Mishnah of the bailment, two people claiming the $200 versus $100, or 200 coins versus 100 coin. There's going to be a juxtaposition of that. And then there's going to be a juxtaposition. You remember the Mishnah with the storekeeper, where there's a henbani? You remember that one? We're going to compare the Mishnah of the bailment to the Mishnah of the, of the storekeeper. So you see how the, the methodology of juxtaposition, it was used very heavily by the hachamim in order to generate meaning. By, by comparing different things, okay? So that, that's a sugya, that's it. You know, you know the whole sugya? Now let's study the details, okay? So you have the, um, the, the, the thing, lema matnitin, you see it? Mm -hmm. Right, right here, lema, does anybody not have it and need a copy? Okay, all right. Yeah, one more copy. 
Here you go. We have a lot of copies, thank God. Okay? All right. Okay. Let us suppose that our Mishnah, the Mishnah of the two garments, two, I'm sorry, one garment, two people grabbing one garment, it is opposed to the minority opinion in the Mishnah that I just read to you with the two people claiming the, each one claiming $200 or 200 golden coins. Why? It cannot, it's, well, for, for starters, it can't possibly follow the minority opinion. Because what did the minority opinion say in that case? The Ikar Biyoseh, the Biyoseh said, Ha'amanim ken might see that I'm The Biyoseh said, look, we can't give the Uben 100 and Shimon 100 and then put 100 in, uh, in trust because uh, we want to punish, there's a, there's a lawyer here, we want to punish him, right? Right, we, we want to make him pay for his lie. And, and again, put, put to the side the question of why do we want to punish him? Okay, don't, don't think about that now, we will later. So he says, we want to, and so what do we do? We take all of the money, take the 300, place it in a trust it account. It can be an honest mistake? It, uh, no, here it can't be. Because, Why not? Well, one is lying. Uh, one is clearly lying. They're both claiming to have given $200. It's not like the, with, the, with the garment where there was a hustle and a tussle and they're both running yes. and they're jumping and they, oh, I got it. No, we're like, oh, one I, guy, I, I One guy knows he's wrong. Exactly. He, he knows he's lying. One guy knows he's lying, exactly. So, so now, if Rabbi Yosef would have applied his reasoning to the case of the two guys grabbing one garment, what would Rabbi Yosef say? Take the garment, put it in trust, and that's it. It might see that I'm mine. That's the way Rabbi Yosef. That's how Rabbi Yosef would. Uh, I'm sorry. Like Joey said, the rabbis would. Yes, exactly. Right. So, so that's what Rabbi Yosef would say. Rabbi Yosef would say, take. So obviously, if you contrast these two Mishnayot, we know that our Mishnah disagrees with Rabbi Yosef. At least that. But let's consider whether our Mishnah even follows the majority opinion in the Mishnah of the Baalman. And what did the majority opinion say? The majority opinion said, take a hundred, give it to the Uven, take a hundred, give it to Shimon, take a hundred, put it in trust, right? But the majority opinion said that you put a hundred in trust, right? Because a hundred is the portion that it's, that's in doubt. Let's apply that to the Talet. What portion of the talet, what portion of the garment is in doubt? The whole thing. We don't know. It could be the whole thing. We don't know who owns the garment. It could be that the Uben got the garment first and Shimon came and started holding on to it. We don't know. So if we apply the reasoning of Hachamim, also the majority opinion of Hachamim, we would put the talet in trust. Right? So it seems that our Mishnah is opposed to the Mishnah, uh, the Belmit Mishnah, right? There's two different opinions. Again, the Belmet Mishnah, everybody agrees in the Belmet Mishnah, whether the Biyoseh or the majority, that you put something in, tr in uh, trust. In the Talet Mishnah, we say, no, no, you just split it 50-50. So again, let me just finish that, I'll get it. So can we say that the Belmet Mishnah, the opinion of Chachamim in that Mishnah follows our Mishnah? Also the Hachamim said that you put something in the trust. You don't split it 50-50. And therefore, in the Mishnah with the garment, the whole garment is in doubt, and since the whole garment is in doubt, the whole thing should be put in trust, even according to Hachamim. That's the apparent opposition between our Mishnah, the garment Mishnah, and the Baal Mishnah. Quick question and then we'll continue. Yeah, but coins are different from a talit. talit. Right. In order to divide it, you'd have to sell it or, or give the proceeds. Right, but conceptually... The conceptually could be shifted around from one to the other. Right, no, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the point is, we, we, you know, we can also sell the talet, give them coins. But the point, but you understand, conceptually, right. certainly the Chachamim would say in the Mishnah of the coins, if you apply the logic of Chachamim to our Mishnah, take the talet, put it in trust. So, haimai. Haima means uh, literally, really. Or, or hi, my. What is this supposed to be? Meaning, questioning your reasoning. Like you tell me something, I'm like, really? Like, is that, is that really your opinion? Right? Like, I, I'm, I'm questioning your logic. So the Gemara, so, so the Gemara now is going to question the previous logic. Hi, my. What is this supposed to be? Meaning, what type of argument are you making? If we're looking at the majority opinion, the majority opinion says that you take the coins and you give each one what definitely belongs to him, right? 
Achad eikal emimal de talvayu hu amir abanan palge b'shvua. If in the case of the coins, the hachamim say that we would take part of it and um, you would put it in um, a trust account, here, of course, the hachamim would say um, that you would take the talet and you would split it 50-50, meaning the majority opinion doesn't disagree with, um, uh, the majority opinion doesn't disagree with our Mishnah. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat this again. Um, in the case of the bailman, the 100 that Hachamim say you should put in the trust account, what is the status of the 100? You tell me. Do we know who it belongs to? No. No, but we do know something. What do we know? It belongs to somebody. It belongs to somebody, exactly. <laughs> it definitely belongs to somebody. It, and, and they say, it, and because it definitely belongs to somebody, put it in trust. Why? I, I found the Dayan. By the way, if I'm the Dayan, I don't want to take the money and give it to the wrong person. I can be liable in the eyes of God. So that money definitely belongs to somebody. Put it in the trust. Okay. In the case of the Talit, does the Talit definitely belong to one side over the other? No. It could be that they both grabbed it at the same time. So there's no reason to say that the hachamim, who in the case of the money that definitely belongs to one side and doesn't belong to the other side, in that case they said put it in trust. Here with the talet may belong to both of them. They wouldn't say put it in trust, they'd say divide it. So the two Mishnayot are perfectly compatible, or rather to say the majority opinion in the Mishnah of the Thelmet is compatible with the Mishnah of splitting the garment. All right. Yes, sir. Surprised that there wasn't an opinion that said that the, the you know bailer should have should be responsible. Right, he took responsibility to take the money from them. Does right, he have, does he have responsibility to keep records? Right. So what? So the um, that's a very good question. And the Gemara on that Mishnah, this Mishnah is in the third chapter of Baba Visiya. It explains that he saw that the two of them trusted each other, and it was reasonable for him to see that they trusted each other because they put the money in the same sack. Uh, okay. So because they put because if they didn't put the money in the same sack, brother, you would be right. Mm -hmm. It would be his responsibility to write down the Ben gave me a hundred, Shimon gave me two hundred. That would be, normally be the case. But here, because they put it in the same sack and it's clear that they were trusting each other, yeah, that so he says they're not they're not um, concerned about lying. Why should I be concerned about them lying? Mm -hmm. So that's that's why. Yeah. Um, there's no there's no connection to the second class with a with a no, 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 it's a different, that's a different case right now. Let's, let's continue. Ella, but let's think about whether we can align our Mishnah, the garment Mishnah, with the Belmit Mishnah according to the opinion, the minority opinion of Yosef. Ella, Iyamat, Yosehi, can you really align that Mishnah with the opinion of the Yosef? Hashata, what does the word Hashata mean? It literally means come now. Like, no. No. Come on. If in the case of the bailment, Rabbi Yosef says, take the entire amount, even though I know for sure that the Uben owns a hundred, even though I know for sure Shimon owns a hundred, Rabbi Yosef says, take everything and put it in trust. Here in the case of the Talet, where I don't know for sure that each one owns a specific amount, there's complete ambiguity. We don't know anything. Of course, in the case of the Talet, Rabbi Yosef um, uh, would disagree. He would not say split the, tal the Talet or the value of the Talet, but rather he would say take the Talet and put it in escrow. If in the case of the Talet where it could be that the whole Talet belongs to one person, of course he would say just put it in escrow. I don't want to deal with this, right? So that's, so, so just to summarize, so apparently our Mishnah, the Mishnah with the garment, can be aligned with the majority opinion in the case of the bailment, but it's, um, there's a dissonance between our Mishnah and the minority opinion, namely the opinion of Rabbi Yosef, because Rabbi Yosef, if he was facing the same situation, he would have taken the garment, he wouldn't split it in two, he would put it in a, uh, in a bailment. All right, um, let's continue. When, I'm sorry, when Eliyahu comes, is that a defined time? No. Or just stays in Israel? No, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an idea, right. So the Gemara says, wait, and, and just so you understand, um, and I want to explain the way, I want you to understand the way this happened, because uh, the, the Gemara is recording the discussions of the court 
the Bedin, the Yeshiva in Babylonia. And these discussions took place over the course of generations. So sometimes you have a situation where the Yeshiva reaches a conclusion. The initial conclusion in this case was that our Mishnah, the garment Mishnah, is completely opposed to the Mishnah of the Baalmet. That was the initial case. But then upon revisiting the matter, the Chachamim said, wait, our Mishnah can be aligned with the majority opinion. And they did so. Now there's again, they're revisiting it again, and they say, wait, hold on. The truth is, if you think carefully about it, you can align our Mishnah, the Mishnah of the garment, with the veilment, even according to the opinion of the Biyoset. And that's what we're going to do now, okay? So this is Afilu um, Temar uh, Biyoset, you have the place? So you're saying it's a different time? It yeah, a lot of times, because don't forget, the Gemara gives you the, the final um, outline of the discussions that took place, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes these discussions were generational, right? right? So, um, so it could be, I'm not saying it's for sure, I don't have any evidence for that because it doesn't mention names. It could be that this discussion took place over time. It could be that maybe it was one long day, right? We don't, we, we, we don't really know, and I can only speculate as to the matter, but we see that, the, that they start out with the particular position, mm -hmm. The first position, the initial starting point was our Mishnah does not, is not aligned with the Mishnah in the Baal Mint. Second stage was, wait, our Mishnah is aligned with the majority opinion in the Baal Mint. Third stage, was, which is what we're reading now, is actually, you know what, we can align our Mishnah also with the Rabi Yosef, okay? Are so I feel... Are there any uh, similar cases in the Talmud you're right. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I I feel, so yes. So yes. In this case, what we're saying is that... Uh, Ruben had, now in this case, he, he loses $100. Shimon has right. nothing to lose. Right. If you both get $100, Shimon only put 100 Right. So he's really making, well, Shimon, so he's been making Ruben lose $100. Rabbi Yosef. You're right. So that's a question. So that, does it make sense? How does it make sense? Why would Rabbi Yosef have such a extreme position? I understand that you want to, you know, make the liar, you know, okay. pay. But the other guy is definitely... <laughs> But well, now you're also pun you're, pu you're punishing yeah. you're punishing both of them equally, right? It's you're only a punishing one of them. Right, right. I mean, right. Yeah, but you're giving the same punishment you're giving to the bad guy. You're giving yeah. to the good guy. Yeah, it's like you're saying here, both of you got a punch in the face. Like, well, wait, why should okay. they both get a punch in the face? Like, you know, right? Okay. Yeah. So okay, and we're going to deal with that. That's a good question. Actually, we're going to see how to um, resolve it. Okay. So I feel okay about it. So we can actually, this is the third and final position of the discussion, was it, whether it was multi-generational, whether it took place in one long day, I don't have evidence. Okay. Um, I know that many sugyot are multi-generational. Okay. That's why I leave it as a, as, as a speculation, right? Afilu uh, tema Yosef. Now, we can align the Mishnah even uh, in accordance with the minority opinion expressed by Rebbe Yosef. Hatam. In the case of the two... Bay lords giving 300 golden coins to the Bailey. Badai Ika Ramai. We know one thing for sure. There is definitely a liar. There is definitely a cheat. One of them is a liar. And therefore, the Biose would say, since there's a liar, I want to punish the liar. I'm a extreme um, a MAGA Republican. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Right, you get the idea. I want to take an extreme position. And I want to punish, I, I don't care that I'm going to be punishing the in, innocent person, I want to punish the, the criminal as well, right? So, um, so, so, but here, in the case of the Talet, maybe there is no liar, maybe there is no cheat. As Michael pointed out at the beginning of the class, it could be that there was a hustle, there was a tussle, they don't know, they say, you know, in the confusion of the fight, who knows who got the Talet first? And in, therefore, in our case of the garment, but the BOC might agree, and the BOC might say, hold on. Don't put it in escrow. I don't know that there's a liar here. I was angry before, because I know one of them is lying. Now I don't know that there's one of them is lying, right? Um, you know, these Dayanim, and, and just so you understand the psychology of the BOC, and, and I kind of understand that, because I saw some of these Dayanim in Israel, I mean, real, real Dayanim. Um, one of them was a trippy. He wrote like a whole series of Shalot to Chubot and Dayanut, and I used to visit him in his house. And I once asked him a question. It was kind of like a, like, and his answer shocked me. But like, it, you, just so you understand the anger of Rabbi Yosef, and Rabbi Yosef, I want to punish this guy. 
Wait, but you're punishing the innocent. But I don't care. I want to punish him. So um, there was once a case of a Kohen who married a, uh, he was married to a convert, right? Which, of course, is against Salacha. And um, right, when is that? only allowed to marry about Israel. He's not allowed to marry a convert. So uh, they called me up, and they had a child, and they wanted to know if I can recommend a mohel. And I immediately, like, my red flags went up, and I said, "Wait, hold on a second. I called the, prof, the rabbi. He's the Abed in Yerushalayim. He was the Abed in Yerushalayim 30 years ago. Tremendous, tremendous um, Tamil Chacham. Anyway, I called him up. I said, Chacham, like, I have this question. Um, I just want to get your okay that, you know, they're making a mislav that eats milah. You know, I just want to give them a mohel. He was so angry. He says, you don't help them under no circumstance. That was it. That was the end of the conversation. <laughs> he said, I don't, I don't allow you to help them. I was shocked. I said, I'm making, it's a mislav. They want to make, it says, you don't help them. Let them find the mohel on their own. So I kind of like, like when I see the BOSS position here, punish this guy. I don't care what. But the baby, the baby is with the baby, you know, he needs a bidit milah. He will get a bidit. He'll, he'll get the bidit milah, obviously, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's no shortage of mohalim in Edis Israel that if I don't give them one, they won't give one. But, but I remember that attitude was a very like, you know, mamashi at shamayim, tremendous fear of God. And he didn't want me doing something that would somehow facilitate what happened, right? So just a little about the psychology of, uh, of the hachamim. So this, you see the biyoset is saying, look, in the case of the bailman, one of them is a liar. Punish them, that's it. Take the money, put it away. In the case of the Talet, we don't know that one of them is a liar, so I'm okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a need to punish them. So take the Talet and split it in half. Inamen. Another possible explanation for why the Biyose in the case of the Bailman took a strict approach and won't take a strict approach in the case of the garment is as follows. Inamen. Hatam kanis le Biyose le namai. Biyose wants to punish the criminal or the cheat not just because he's angry, but because he wants to create a disincentive to lying. Because now if the liar realizes, wait, I just lost my money. I just forget about the $100 that I wanted to cheat. I just lost my own $100. So now if the Ramai realizes he's losing his money, everybody's losing money, says, you know what, just forget it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the money is yours. Take the 200. Just give me my 100. He should, he should confess up. Admit, admit guilt. Admit guilt. So in that case, we would say what? The Biyoseh would say, yeah, take the 300 to compel the liar to fess up. Haha, but in the case of the Taleb, what does he care? Let's say there's one guy is actually a liar and a cheat in the case of the uh, Taleb, right? The Reuben got the Taleb, Shimon two minutes later comes and tries to grab it from him. He's obviously lying, right? All right, take the Taleb, put it in escrow. What do I care? I didn't belong to me in the first place. I'm not losing any money. I wanted to get it. Maybe eventually they'll release it from escrow. I don't know what. So, so, so there's no reason in the case of the Taleb for the... Um, liar to fess up. There's nothing to compel him, even if there was a liar in that case. So either way, we distinguish the two cases. We distinguish the case of the garment from the case of the bailment, right? And it comes out, and you see how the opposition, how beautiful it is by, by, by putting these two disparate elements. You remember I showed you some of the paintings, right? How they put things together, um, uh, or in literature, fair is foul, foul is fair, Macbeth, Shakespeare, right? So you see, by putting these two, two things together, it helps you understand more deeply the legal issues involved in the thinking of the hachamim, right? That's a beautiful uh, idea. So I just wanted to, to wanted to uh, appreciate that. What would happen in that case if one of them did say, "All right, never mind, I was lying"? That does that make sense? Yeah, meaning if one of them fessed up and said, "Never mind, I was lying," it would end at the issue of the monetary dispute. Um, if he made like a shivwa, yeah. it would only be the beginning for him. <laughs> yeah. Right, it, it would only be the beginning. I mean that seriously. Um, so, <laughs> so okay. So that was the yeah. But but the, the, the but the court trial is over. They take the money. They give two hundred dollars to the other guy, and the, the liar walks away with his hundred. And thank you very much. But they, one of the things about the courts, the Jewish courts, we're not interested in philosophizing too much. You know, you gave him the money, gave him the money, let God do what God does, knows how to do. We don't need to get involved in everything, right? We, we get involved in some things. All right, Tana. 
Yes. What if he refuses to take it Of what? If he refuses to take it Oh no, and then it depends, depends what the situation is. Meaning, there are cases where, usually um, in Jewish law, you have a to'en and you have a nit'an. The to'en is the, um, the, the plaintiff and the nit'an is the defendant. So usually in Jewish, uh, in Jewish law, let's say for example, the Reven says, you owe me, uh, you know, pay me $100, you owe me $100, and Shimon says, no, I only owe you 25 for example. So in that case, he would have to make a shivua. Shimon would have to make a shivua. But there's different types of intricacy. What if he doesn't want to make a shivua? What happens then? So there's different laws and there's the different. Case. What? If he doesn't make, he loses the case. So uh, right. So what depends? He could try to reverse the shivua. There's different. There's a lot of details in the shivua how it works. But if he doesn't want to make a shivua, he can technically he can lose the case as a general rule. So let's say in our case, the talet. Two people are holding the talet. So Ruben says, I had it first. Shimon said, I had it first. And the Bedin says, okay, make a Shabbat. He doesn't want to make a Shabbat, no problem. The, the, the Talit goes to the other side, to your point, right? But I just want to point out that the laws of Shabbat are very intricate, and there's different details as to how it might work, right? Okay, let's continue. Ela, Atena, Mesia. Okay, so we just compared the Mishnah of the Bailment, both the majority opinion and the opinion of Yosef, to the Mishnah of the garment, right? We did that very nicely. But do you remember that the Mishnah of the garment had a second part? Namely, two people walk into the store, they both throw the money, they, they run out, they're both uh, holding on, let's say it was a chest, they're both holding on to the chest, and they say, it's mine, I paid first, I paid first. Let's think about that for a moment. Would the Rabbi say agree with that? Meaning, our Mishnah said that if they both out, walk out with the chest, they come to Bedin, the Dayan says, Govin, what's going on? He says, I paid for this first. Okay, he goes to Shimon, what's, why, why are you holding on? If he paid for it first, why are you holding on? No, I paid for it first. Okay, make a shavuah. So they make a shavuah, we split it 50-50. Okay, very good. Would the Biyos agree with that? Now, what did we say before? So tenach, messiah, okay, very nice. So we now, we now compare the case of the uh, garment to the case of the bailment, works perfectly. What about mekach memkan? Does the case of the two people walking out of the store with one item, each one claiming to have paid for the item first, is that case, can that case be aligned with the opinion of Biyosem? How would we analyze that, right? Because in that case, um, if there's a liar, confiscating the chest would hurt him. Why? He paid for it, you remember? Both people paid for it. The Reuven gave $100, Shimon gave $100, they both ran out of the store, it's mine, I paid for it first. So, in the case of the talit, we said that uh, Rabbi Yosef wouldn't impose the penalty of taking the whole talet and putting it in escrow because the liar, if there is a liar, he doesn't care. He didn't lose anything. In the case of the chest, if we took the chest and put it in escrow, what happens to the liar? He ain't getting his hundred dollars back. He paid a hundred dollars. He lost a hundred dollars. So in that case, Rabbi Yosef would actually say, take the chest and put it in escrow. How would you explain that? So therefore, the only way to compare the, um, the Mishnah of the garment, the Mishnah of the chest, and align it perfectly with the Mishnah of the velment is to say as follows. The reason that Rabbi Yosef wants to take the money, the entire velment and put it in a trust, in an account, is not because he's trying to incentivize the liar or disincentivize the liar from lying, it's only because he's, he wants to punish them. It's a punishment, it's not a disincentive. We actually want to punish him, and we're now looking at whether it would incentivize or not incentivize the, uh, the liar. So let me summarize it, and uh, according to that. In the case of the bailman, there's 300 uh, golden coins or 300 silver coins. We say, according to the Biosa, take the whole thing, put it in, 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 in trust. Why? We don't think the liar's gonna fess up. That's not the issue. We just want to punish them. Why do we want to punish them? Uh, Joey uh, asked that question. I still didn't answer it. We'll answer it at the end. Okay, but we want to punish them. In the case of the garment, it could be that there's no liar, there's no cheat, so there's no reason to punish them. So the Biyosei would agree with the Mishnah, split it 50-50, and that's it. In the case of the chest also, the Biyosei would say, it's not clear that there's a liar. It's not clear that there's a cheat. It could be they both threw the money and they don't, even, they don't know themselves 
<laughs> whether the money uh, who, who pay first, right? It could be he genuinely believes he paid first. So also in that case, the Biosei would say, don't punish him, because we don't know that there's a clear lie. We don't know there's a clear cheat, right? But in the case of the veil man, punish him, confiscate the money, put the money with the judges, end of story, okay? And that's the final conclusion of the Gemara. That's the final Pesach of the Gemara in comparing these two sets or these three sets of Mishnayot. All right? Let's go now to part B. Um, and you remember, and I'm just going to refresh your memory um, because uh, we studied this about two, three weeks ago, so I'm not sure if you remember the case of the Chenvanis. So I will mention it to you now. Okay. Um, the case of the Chenmani, you remember, there was a, an employer, okay? He was called the Baalabai. The employer wants to pay his employee. How did you pay? Back then you would pay with food or maybe clothing. Okay, you would even pay with money perhaps, but what you would do is you would send your employee to the store and you would have a deal with the store owner whereby the employer spoke to the store owner. He says, listen, I have an employee coming. He needs to, I need to pay him $10. Give him $10 worth of goods. And the store owner says, sure, no problem. He's going to come here and he, um, he registers um, the employer uh, in his ledger. Yes, correct. The employer owes me um, uh, $10. Okay? And then the employee comes into the store. He takes the whatever, food, uh, clothing, whatever he takes. All right. That was the case. What happened? Next day, the uh, store owner goes to the employer. He says, okay, give me the $10. I want it. All right. Next day, <laughs> the employee goes to the employer. He says, you know, I never got paid. <laughs> I never got paid. So it's like, give me my $10. He said, what, what are you talking about? I, I just heard from the employer, uh, from the store owner. The employer is telling his uh, worker, but the store owner just told me to pay him $10 because he says that he gave you $10. The employer says, I don't know. He didn't give me $10. What do you want? I want to get paid for my services. I work for you. Pay me $10. Store owner says, I made you a loan. Pay me $10. So what, what happens? You remember what the is? The, the store owner has to make a shivwa that he gave the $10 to the employee. The employer has to make a shivwa that, I'm sorry, not the employer, my mistake. The employee has to make a shivwa that he wasn't paid. And, and the employer has to pay $10 to his employee and $10 to the store owner. Okay, so you remember that, you remember that case? Zenish um, Hotel, Zenish Hotel. Usually it's not like that. Usually when you have a plaintiff, the plaintiff is not the one who makes the shiva, it's a defendant. That's why I brought you the case of the Twain and the Nitaan. Usually it's a defendant who makes the shiva. Not always, but different, you know, different types of situations. And here's one of the situations where the plaintiff, the employee, says, I want to get paid, I've worked. Okay. We're going to let you get paid. Just make a shabbat. Well, store owner says, I made, a, I made a loan. I want to get paid. I can't give loans to people. Okay, make a shabbat. Well, no problem. So that was the case. Let's compare now that case. The employer paid 20. Then. I'm sorry? The employer, the employer. You know it. He has to pay, yeah. He has to pay 20. Yeah? No, he, he never paid originally, right? Because he never paid originally. So he just told the he he the employer only went to the store and he says, "Do me, I'll pay you later, and just put it in your ledger, right in your ledger." You see? So yes, but he loses ten dollars. You're right. He loses ten dollars. He's paying twenty. Why is he paying twenty? Somebody's lying. So let's read that. So this is the second part of the subya, a juxtaposition of the case of the storekeeper to the case of the bailment. All right. Then the banan, then the Rebiyose, we look at the majority opinion or the minority opinion of the in the Mishnah of the Bailment. How would they make Pesach Halacha in the case of the storekeeper? We said, the Mishnah said, in the case of the storekeeper, the employee makes the Shavua and the storekeeper makes the Shavua and each one collects ten dollars, right? How would they do it here? Um, why don't we say in that case, obviously somebody is lying, okay? Either the storekeeper paid money to the employee, in which case the employee is obviously lying, or he never paid money to the uh, employee, in which case the storekeeper is lying. Somebody is lying. There's no way out of that, right? 
Somebody is lying. And, it, and what did we say if somebody is lying? We said that according to the BOC, he's angry and he wants to you know, punish him, so to speak. Punitive measure, take the money. So why don't we do that here? Why don't we tell the Hanvani, just put the $10 in uh, with the court. Don't pay this guy $10, don't pay that guy $10, just put $10 with the court. And somebody's going to lose that money. Why not? Right? Right? So what's the difference? What's the difference? I'm sorry? He works for him. He works for him? Okay, so we're going to see. We're going to see. Not far, but we're going to see. Amen. So let's analyze the case of the storekeeper. The employee says, I'm sorry, um, not the other way around, the, the, the storekeeper. The storekeeper tells the employer, look, you wanted me to lend you $10, you asked me to be your shaliach, you asked me to be the person who pays your employee, right? I was going to front the money, I'm your shaliach, I'm your agent, right? Don't, don't, don't come to me and tell me that the employee is complaining that he never got paid. I, I can't help you with that. That's between you and him. That's nothing to do with me. I gave him the money. If you have a problem with your employee, deal with it separately. I want my money paid back. Now you're going to say, wait, wait. You know what? Let's bring the employee to court and let the employee make a shiva instead of the sto- in front of the storekeeper that he never got paid. I, I don't want, I, I'm not interested in his shiva. I, I never did business with them. When you do business with somebody, it's because you trust them, right? No, I'm like, I'll, I will never do business with a person that I don't trust, and I will never do business with a person that I don't think that his Shavuah means anything, because if his Shavuah doesn't mean anything, I, I wouldn't want to do business with him, because if he ever lied to me, we'd go to court, and he'll make a full Shavuah, so I wouldn't want to do business with him. So that, the, the Hanbani is saying, I don't know who this employee is. You want me to go to court, and he's going to make a Shavuah that I paid him. What do I care that he makes a Shavuah that I paid him? I don't know who he is. He could be a liar. He could be a cheat. Doesn't interest me. I'm, I did business with you, Mr. Employer. Give me my ten dollars back. Um, even if he makes the shiva in court, meaning the storekeeper is talking to the employer and saying, even if the employee makes the shiva in court, I don't believe him. You, on the other hand, you, Mr. Employer, let me ask you a question. You told me to pay him ten dollars, right? Did you tell me that I should do it only in the presence of witnesses? because the witnesses would see and then the witnesses would know. Well, you never told me that. So apparently you trusted your employee and you wanted me to trust your employee. And I trusted him, I gave him the money. Nobody told me bring witnesses, nobody told me sign anything. I didn't bring witnesses, that's because you didn't tell me to bring witnesses. So, so do me a favor, just pay me my money and don't involve me with your wajaras on the other side. It doesn't interest me. You have a problem with your workers, take it up with your workers. Okay. Now the employee, is going to the Balabait, he's going to his employer, and he's saying, I never got paid. And the Balabait is saying, well, what are you talking about? But the storekeeper told me that he paid you. So he's going to say the same thing. The employee's going to say, Ana kabach. I work for you. I perform services for you. What do I care about the storekeeper? You're saying the storekeeper is supposed to pay me. Now, if you're going to bring me to court and bring the storekeeper to court, and the storekeeper will make a shavua in court saying, I paid him, I don't trust him. I don't know who he is. And therefore, the conclusion in that case is the storekeeper makes a shavua to the balabait, I paid your employee. The employee makes a shavua to the balabait, to the employer, I never got paid. And the employer has to pay $10 to the storekeeper, $10 to his employee. End of story. In that case, Rabbi Yosef would agree. In the case of the bailment, what did Rabbi Yosef say? No. Take the money and put, put it in es- escrow or trust account or whatever. Why? What's the difference? What is the difference? You understand? Why in that case, and, and this is, and now we're going to understand why the Gemara does this juxtaposition and how brilliant it is. I just want to make sure that you're not missing anything. Right, exactly. What's the difference? Why, why is he farming out to everybody? You go to him, you to be responsible for your immediate requirements. You have to get your employer. Don't get somebody else involved to pay your employer. Oh, but he's allowed to do it. He is. Okay. He's allowed to do it. But if you don't trust your employee, then make sure to tell the uh, storekeeper, bring witnesses, have to be a, you know, make sure that there's Adim, that they see it. Don't give him the money unless there's Adim. Because he lied, that's his responsibility, he didn't do it. 
But now, now you understand you what's happening. You have an agent that's no direct connection. Right. So I'm going to explain. Let me explain. Let me explain what's happening here. And now you're going to see the difference between the two cases, and you're going to understand the Biosa's position. In the case of the Chenbani, of the storekeeper, the employer, the employee, you're dealing with three different persons. These three persons have three different relationships. The employer has a relationship with the employee. Um, the employer has a relationship with the storekeeper. I'm sorry, two different relations. The sp- storekeeper was told to play the employee. There's no direct relationship between the storekeeper and the employee. The storekeeper owes nothing, owes nothing to the employee. The employee owes nothing to the storekeeper. So it's three different persons and two relationships, right? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How many people were there in the, um, in the bailment? Two. In the bailment? Three. Three. There was the bail... Bailey, the person who received the money, and there was the two bailors. Did the two bailors come together or individually? Together. Together. Okay. So they 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 now let me um, ask another question. You have a corporate entity, right? A corporate entity does something wrong. Who suffers? Everybody. Everybody. A Fox News just paid the million dollars, like close to a billion dollars, whatever it was. Okay, for some uh, you know problem. Who suffers from that? Um, uh, court case, the owners of Fox News. Oh, but I'm innocent. Well, you know, it's, you're part of that entity, right? So when the Uben and Shimon come to the Bay Lee, they come to Levi and they give them a sack of 300, they're actually one entity. In that one entity, somebody is a liar. Punish the entity. You can't punish the individuals anymore because you don't know who to punish. So you punish the entity. The two of them form one entity. Together they form that one relationship between the Bay Lees, which is them, and the Baylor, which is Levi. Now, had they come and, 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 and they said, wait, wait, I don't want our money mixed in together. The event says, here's $100, please write down $100. Shimon says, here's $200, he writes down $200. Then they would be three separate people and two separate relationships. It would be the Oben with the, with the Bailey, with Levi, Shimon with Levi. That would be fine. Then we wouldn't take the money and confiscate it because why would we punish if we don't know that there's definitely a liar, definitely a cheat? When do we say that we punish that because there's a liar, there's a cheat? If the two people together form a partnership, a corporation, they're legally um, uh, connected as they are, then there's something wrong with you people. I don't know which one of you, but there's something wrong here. So we're going to take the $300 that you gave me as one corporation, as one partnership, as one entity, and we're going to confiscate it. And you guys figure out which one of you is a crook. It's not our business, right? But as a corporation, you, this is a crooked corporation, so we're punishing them. That's what Abiyo says, says. But in the case of the Hanbani, you have a storekeeper, you have an employee, you have an employer. Each individual is separate. There is no legal connection between the employee and the employer. We said together they sin. There was no together we sin. There's three people, two relationships, and therefore we don't make this collective punishment. The collective punishment of Abiyo says is only applicable when there is that partnership or some sort of you know, legal privity between the people. Is this understood? And that answers your question as well. And now you see the brilliance of the Gemara in juxtaposing these different cases because through the juxtaposition, we really fully understand how the Hachamim made the Pesach al I see it's time to, uh, to end the class, but if there's any questions, I'll take them now. Um, so uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Have a good have a Next week class? Um, but yeah, I believe so. Unless, unless I announce otherwise in the synagogue. Next week, hopefully again. Well, the